Wait, wait, where's the camera? <laughs> Hey Hill City, my name is Natalie and I'm part of the team here. If you're new here this morning, we want to say a big thank you for taking time out of your weekend to watch with us today. We want you to know that Hill City is a safe place to explore your faith. So bring your doubts, questions, and fears and we'll stick with you through them. If you're new, new-ish, or have been around for a while but are ready to get it plugged in, you should come to our welcome brunch next Sunday the 10th after service. You'll hear more about our story, our culture, and find out how to join the team. You can RSVP by January 7th at this link. You can also register for one of our live services happening next Sunday at 9.30 and 11 at that same link as before. It was this one. That's all from me. Next up, we've got a few songs and then the first message in our Back to the Future series. Thanks for being here. Your love, your love for me, sin cast away From west to east, oh God, your grace for me, it never ends So I praise you, I praise you, I praise you, I praise you, Lord Great is your love, your love for me, sin cast away
the waves When oceans rise My soul will rest in your embrace For I am yours And you are mine Oh, oh, oh. Your grace abounds in deepest waters Your sovereign hand will be my God Well, good morning and happy new year, everybody. Um, I hope that this holiday season was a good one for uh, everybody. And just thank you for joining us here uh, this morning and kicking your new year off right um, by taking some time to uh, just focus on your faith and take some steps towards Jesus. Hopefully if this is your first time uh, with us. My name is John Wagler and I'm part of this Hill City team and so grateful that you decided to join us here uh, this morning and I hope Hill City becomes a place that you can call uh, home. You know, kicking off this uh, new year comes with a lot of excitement, a lot of goals, uh, a lot of new thoughts, a lot of new vision and all of that and uh, of course for us as a church it's it's no different and you know, I, I shared a little bit about this um, during the Christmas Eve services but half my year of 2020 was uh, spent in what's known as the dark night of the soul, where it's the season where you're doing all the kind of normal things that you would do spiritually and engaging God, like through prayer and meditation and all these different ways, but you just feel like this disconnection. And in that, what ends up happening is this kind of like purging of things inside of you, this um, 
And it's a moment where you got to trust in the goodness of God and a faith that if you just keep pushing, he's going to be on the other side of this and a breakthrough is going to happen. And uh, in the beginning of December, that's actually exactly what happened for me uh, after roughly six months or so of just feeling like, man, no matter what I was doing, I was feeling so disconnected. What ended up happening was I had this incredible breakthrough um, with God and felt like, um, just like this huge, like almost burden lifted off my shoulders, this weight lifted off my shoulders and really um, felt like the spirit of God was just working in me in a way I just felt like so renewed and refreshed. And, and it made me start thinking about uh, the start of our church and um, how much excitement was there and uh, this this vision that we had of what we wanted the church to be. And and then it got me going again for, for this year and really just felt like I was just saying, hey, this is time for, for something new, something fresh. Um, essentially, uh, a church terminology would be to kind of replant the church. And, um, and that's why we're calling the series Back to the Future, because we know uh, we want to go back to basically basics, back to the beginning, back to the heart of where all of this started so that our future is going to be an incredible one. Some of you guys who uh, are maybe roughly my age uh, in your 40s and I probably remember the great Back to the Future movies, but um, we just, we, that's what we desire for our church is this, um, we want to go back so that our future is going to be so incredible. And I believe that God has really place something fresh and something new for us. And it's exciting. I think it's going to bring about some new ministry opportunities. Um, I think it's going to impact a lot of people in the city. Um, but I think there's some things that go along with that that are important that I want to address today. Um, the first scripture that actually came to mind when I was going through this process in, in December and I'm jotting down all these notes of like content of what we want to do and some different ministry ideas and some different um, bigger vision kinds of things. And I, I immediately, uh, I felt like God just like pointed me right to John chapter six. And it's this uh, story where Jesus is talking to all these people who start following him. And in, in, his group was growing so much. There were so many, there were probably thousands of people at that point following Jesus. And he has this really kind of hard teaching and one that was like, difficult for people to take in. And, um, and he, Jesus responds to them because they were just like, this is so hard. Like, this is way too hard. How could we possibly do this? This doesn't make any sense. And this doesn't, I, I don't know if I can do this. And Jesus' response to them is this. In John chapter 6, he says, From this time, many of the disciples turned back and no longer followed him. And he, took the, he looks to the 12, his kind of closest crew, and he says this, You do not want to leave too, do you? Now, we don't know the inflection of how Jesus said that. Was that a, he was wondering whether or not they were going to do, or was that a challenge to them? But it was this moment where, as I'm reading that passage again, I, I realized that Jesus wasn't begging people to stay. He was very confident in who he is and who he was and in what his mission was. And he really wanted to know who wanted to follow him, who wanted to be in on his heart, his vision, who really wanted to be a part of, of his crew of people to accomplish his mission to build his kingdom here on this earth. He was not begging people to stay. He was willing to say hard things. He was willing to address hard topics. He was willing to engage some of the systematic things that were at play, were at play with even in the religious circle. And, um, and willing to, to really challenge all those things. And if people weren't okay with that, he was just kind of like, you know what? you're not ready, or you know what, you're not actually following me, or you got your mindset and heart set on other things. And it started making me think about for us as a church, you know, um, when, when you look at, I, I should say this, when you look at the larger church in America in particular, um, it's sick. And there, I don't want to say it's all sick. Of course, there are healthy elements, right? There are healthy people within that. There are healthy things going on. There's some pretty, actually, extraordinary things going on in certain pockets. But as a whole, the church in general is sick. I, I think um, when you look at uh, the evidence that's out there, you can look through how the church has responded to things around the virus, uh, around the election, around uh, discussions about race, discussions about sexuality, discussions about nationalism, idolatry, those kinds of things. And, and you see that both progressive and uh, conservative Christianity is really unhealthy as a whole. And it doesn't mean that everyone who kind of 
puts themselves in those categories is unhealthy, but as a whole, they, they really are. And, and what I found is that the more you read the teachings of Jesus, um, he was always outside of the progressive and the conservative thought. And that's where he resided. And, and I believe that for us as a church, um, that that's where we're supposed to reside as well. That um, you can't, my hope is that you would never label yourself as a progressive or as a conservative. That you want to be outside of that because you follow Jesus. Because Jesus is always going to be outside of those ter- two things. And, and I'll be honest, it's the most dangerous place that you can be. Um, I know we like to talk about the mob or you hear people say stuff like that in different ways um, when it comes to social media or groupings of people because here's the reality. If you want to stay outside of conservative and progressive uh, circles, um, you're going to get attacked by both of them. And um, and it's a tough place to be, uh, but I just want to encourage you that it's the Jesus place to be. And that's the place where Jesus wants us. It's the place that Jesus wants us as a church. And it's really where I felt like the spirit it was just like gripping my heart and gripping the very like guts of my my being and just saying to lead the church to this place and do not settle and do not shrink back from it. And there's going to be folks, and you might already be here listening to this and being like, oh, I don't know where this is going. Um, it, there are going to be folks that are going to be like, you know what? I don't I don't want to go there. Uh, I, I like my camp, and um, and that might be your call, but. Uh, we're not going to shrink back as that for a church. And, um, and I want to set the tone for us um, the first Sunday of the year to begin to thinking about the right way. Um, but for us to do that, I want to go back before we go to the future. Uh, you know, when, because some of you guys don't know part of this story, you know, we're six and a half years old uh, now at this point as a church. We had our first uh, service in September of 2014. Um, but I was going back through um, some things I had written down years ago. And there's a song, Oceans. And um, you guys, some of you guys have heard me talk about this before. And this reason um, why, you know, we've sang it so many times in our church and everything. But in this song, I played a pivotal role um, for uh, the, uh, our church being established at Hill City. And so in June 9th of 2013, we had already made the decision that we wanted to plant a church, and uh, we were kind of wavering in that. Um, but that June, we were in Chicago visiting some friends, and the song Oceans comes on, and uh, we were just really taken back by the lyrics of it. And uh, in that moment, both Lacey and I were just sobbing in the service and feeling like, God was really um, just encouraging us to, to to trust Him, to let the Spirit lead us, um, let the to to be willing to to you know like in the midst of the waves and all this stuff, like to to truly trust Him in the midst of us and to take the step that we needed to to take, and that became a pivot point for us of of having confidence in what God was calling us to do. Well, along that same time, we had. Um, I had become obsessed with the story of Peter um, getting out of the boat, walking on the water, having the faith to do so, while the other you know disciples were sitting in the boat not doing anything, and and how Jesus responded to Peter and everything. And so it was you know it was those the song oceans and that that story um, and Matthew with Peter um, were kind of coinciding. Um, on uh, in later in August, uh, we were August sixteenth. We were. Um, uh, we had, were doing college ministry at that time, and uh, we were telling our students about this story and really trying to provoke this idea, this thought to like get out of the boat kind of uh, mentality. Um, uh, two days after that, on August 18th, uh, we had a meeting with a school, Albert, Albert Hill Middle School, um, here in the city of Richmond, that we had thought that we were guaranteed space there and had plans to to really we we had told them hey we're going to want to put put about 50 grand into the school right away we'll upgrade all of your technology in the school we'll um, do everything in the auditorium we want some we have some ideas for teachers lounge and some things we want to do for students all these different things and the school is so excited for us to to come in there and on that day in August 18th we met with the principal and there was a just like you could just feel the room. There was like this spirit in the room. Um, before the principal even said anything, I, I just looked over at Lacey and just said, "Hey, um, it's not going to happen." And um, and so we were at what we thought where we had our location. That didn't work out. Um, a couple of days after that, on August twentieth, I was talking to a, a friend of mine, Kevin, and explaining the story to him. And um, and and he just looked at me. He goes, "Screw it, Wags." 
Like we got to trust God. You know, we, we, we got to, and he didn't even realize he was saying this, but he, he goes, you know, just like in the story of Peter, you got to get out of the boat and just trust him. And, um, and, and so I was like, you're right. We got to just trust, <laughs> trust God in all of this. And it wasn't, um, but uh, a couple of weeks after that, uh, I'm sorry, it was about eight weeks after that, that, um, that I knew some people from U-Turn and we were able to get in this building and they offered up the space here. One other thing that happened in the midst of this was uh, we decided that um, we were just going to do this. We wanted to plant a church and we didn't even know who wanted to do it with us yet at this point in time and all of that. Um, but we knew God was calling us to do this and, um, and knew the area that we wanted to do this in. And, but we didn't have any money. Like we, uh, we weren't being sent with any money. We didn't have like this endowment of, of some kind or anything like that. I was, uh, you know, had been in ministry for a, a little while at that point in time. And as most of you guys know, ministry does, isn't exactly the most high paying thing uh, either. But um, I had been in the corporate world before ministry. And uh, so when we made this decision to plant the church, what ended up happening uh, was we we just decided, you know what, we're going to empty out our 401k and we're going to invest it in the church. Um, we're going to trust God in, in this. And um, and then Lacey just got a random job at a salon working the front desk. Um, and and then we just kept praying that God would come through. Well, on uh, September uh, 3rd of 2013, um, what ended up happening was um, we... I was on a phone call with my old boss at my old job that I had left there several years before that. And um, he said, hey, do you want to come back? And uh, I was like, oh, my gosh, this is crazy. And he's, he wasn't a believer. And, and uh, he said, do you want to come back? And I said, yes, that would be amazing. Uh, I can only give you about 15 hours a week or so. And he goes, that's fine. Uh, no problem. And he said, how much money do you want? And I said, I shot out a number for 15 hours a week that was pretty high, and um, he came back with me with a number that was um, 16 grand higher than what I had actually shot out there. And he goes, you know what, you deserved it for all the years you were with us before. And, um, and that number to the dollar matched the salary I was leaving from the church that we were at. And God provided un incredibly in that moment because we decided to trust. And um, right after that, I was in a meeting and this woman leans over. She was sitting next to me and she leans over and she whispers in my ear. She goes, John, she said, have you um, ever heard that song Oceans yet? And, uh, and I just, I didn't say anything. I just kind of shook my head. Yes. And, and, um, and she, she goes, I don't know why, but I was praying this morning and God told me that that song is for you and Lacey. And, um, and te I began to like well up with tears because she didn't know like really any of the story um, that was going on and what our goals were and, and that we were even going to plant a church at that point in time. And so I say all of that to bring you back to this core element of this idea of I want the heart of our church to always be willing to step out of the boat to trust God in the midst of this, if the wind and the waves and the storms like are raging, that we know who we have our trust in. We know that in the midst of this, that we're still going to be willing to, to get out of the boat. And, and I, I think even when you're thinking about how volatile um, kind of the progressive and conservative circles are right now, um, do we trust God enough to begin to walk on those waters, to, to reside in a camp that is outside of those two, to reside in a place where Jesus wants us to be. When we discuss cultural topics, to be where Jesus wants us to be. When we engage scripture, to be where Jesus wants us to be. To have that kind of heart where Jesus wants us to be, and it's not going to be easy. Um, you're going to feel, and I'm going to feel, and the leaders of our community are going to feel the weight of this decision, feel the weight of this mission, to feel the weight of this responsibility, to understand it's not going to just be appeasing to people. It's going to be challenging to all of us in a lot of different ways. And, and, um, but at the end of it, what ends up happening is it might be the hardest, but it's going to be the most fruitful. Um, it, it, it's going to be uh, unbelievably difficult in a lot of ways, um, but in the end, we are going to be honoring and giving glory to God and trusting to God in the midst of this. The problem that I think that has happened um, kind of holistically with Christianity is we try, we have tried to tame the message of Jesus. We've tried to, to, to um, carve the, ma the message of Jesus out with just kind of to please itchy ears. But, oh, I don't want to offend someone or, or, or that might hurt them or whatever. And, and of course, I believe in grace and all that stuff. And I'll talk about that in a, in a second. But man, we've got to be centered on the right things and, and be willing to step forward in the right way. Um, 
And this woman, Dorothy Sayers, uh, said this quote, uh, the people who hanged Christ never, and to do them justice, uh, accused him of being a bore. On the contrary, they thought him too dynamic to be safe. It has been left for later generations to muffle up that shattering personality and surround him with an atmosphere of tedium. And I feel like that describes um, the church in general right now. And so I want to highlight a few uh, different things for us. Um, this over the next several weeks, um, I want these to be building blocks for this new season as a church. It's not that we're throwing away the last six and a half years. There's a lot to celebrate, um, a lot to give God glory for, uh, a lot to, um, a lot of incredible stories um, that you guys have all been a part of. And, um, and so we honor that and we celebrate that. But God is pushing us to something new. And God is pushing us to um, experience him in a different way. So the first, I want to highlight a few different things. The first thing is this, that we've got to be Jesus-centered. Jesus-centered. I referenced this a, a little bit already um, in the intro, but um, every Christian says they want to be Jesus-centered, okay? I don't know of a Christian that doesn't say that. Um, but after a few questions, a lot of times you quickly realize that uh, you know, there's a chunk of Christians who just aren't. They're, they're not Jesus-centered. I love what Lacey said last week, and we didn't even talk about um, matching this up, but she talked about uh, essentially wanting to be obsessed with the teachings of Jesus, obsessed with uh, reading through the Gospels, which are Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And um, in detail, I would probably lump in Acts into that too, um, but detailing out the teachings of Jesus and what happened with the church community uh, after that. And to just if, if you do nothing else this year, um, I would just encourage you to just keep reading those four Gospels plus Acts and um, keep reading those over and over and over and over again this year and watch what the teachings of Jesus begin to do in your heart and how it begins to shift your mind. Jesus in Mark 8 was teaching and he said this. He said, um, he called out to the crowd uh, to, along with his disciples and said, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever, uh, but whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. He then continues on in verse 36. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? If anyone, this part is like, this part gripped my heart um, reading this. If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when he comes in the Father's glory with the holy angels. And here's what Jesus is saying here. If you're not willing to be centered on me, and you just fear man too much, and you fear the mob of people too much, or you fear the side too much, or you fear your conservative progressive friends or parents or family too much to stand up for me. If you're ashamed of that, then someday you'll stand before me and you'll receive the same thing. That's a hard teaching, an unbelievably hard teaching. But what it's doing is it's showing how serious this is how serious it is to be Jesus-centered, how serious it is um, to not play around with all of this stuff, to not play around to, you know, just going along with what culture is saying or whatever, and um, how serious it is to, to be Jesus-centered in our theology. Theology matters. I'm all for talking about cultural, you guys know this already, like this is a part of who we are. We, um, I think it was Karl Barth who, who talked about having the Bible in one hand and a newspaper in the other, um, because you want to be able to speak into cultural topics and everything. And we love that. We want to engage those topics and it's hard and all this stuff, but we want to stay Jesus centered in all of it. I had um, someone um, a while ago, we were in an email exchange who, who made this comment to me uh, about, we had difference of opinions on a subject matter. And and they said to me, well, you got to push theology aside here. You can't push theology aside. You can't do it. Um, I think what has happened in uh, the church too much because we fear man and we fear side um, is that we're allowing culture to dictate our hearts, culture to dictate our thinking, culture to, to, to dictate the way we um, 
engage a, any kind of social topic. Um, that's not the right way to do it. We end up lost. We end up just like thinking like the world. We end up trying to get around scripture. We don't in, engage the spirit of God like we should. We would rather be like, well, I feel, and those are a lot of statements, and I bet, well, I feel it's this way, and I feel, well, well, uh, you know, the hype, I see it this way, and, and we never get to the point of like, how do you think Jesus sees this? But we've got to be Jesus-centered. Um, I read this quote by Kier, uh, uh, Soren Kierkegaard this week. He said it this way, act just once in such a manner that your action expresses that you fear God alone and man not at all, and you will immediately in some measure cause a scandal. And all he's saying there is, man, if you really want to be Jesus-centered and you show that you don't fear man, that you, you just want to give God glory, you just want to follow Jesus, like that is the core of your being, it's going to be scandalous. It's going to be some people are going to be like, what are you doing? And it's like, no, no, I'm trying to focus on Jesus. See, I think our language um, approaching subject matter should be things like this. And, and I think this is the way we engage one another, the way that we talk to one another, the way that um, we really uh, even like kind of self-reflect um, might be something like this. How does this tie into what Jesus taught? That's like a really good question to ask ourselves or ask someone else. Like in the midst of you're talking with another Christian and you're discussing a cultural topic of any kind, uh, asking each other, how does this tie into what Jesus taught? Or, um, or maybe like if you're someone's asking you something or you're engaging, someone's going through like a life changing, like they're trying to find themselves and different things like that. Like uh, saying uh, a question like this, like um, how are you letting Jesus speak into this? And, and beginning to engage things in that manner. Um, I want us as a church to deeply care about what's happening culturally. We cannot be blind and ignorant and judgmental and condemning towards the things of this world. Like, I, but we've got to engage it with a Jesus-centered lens. If we don't, um, we're not offering up anything different. Here's the second thing that I think is really important for us. Um, we, need, uh, we need messy grace. I want to be a community that is full of messy grace. See, to give grace is to appreciate someone's process. Um, the truth is, if Jesus wanted a finished product, he never would have chosen the disciples. Um, he wouldn't want anything to do with me. <laughs> he wouldn't want anything to do with you either. Um, he, it's not about the finished pro process or product. Um, it's about the process. To, to give grace to people um, can sometimes feel maddening, can sometimes feel frustrating. Um, I sometimes feel like someone doesn't deserve it. That's the point of grace, right? But when we're Jesus-centered, what ends up happening is our only choice and our only way that we can engage someone else is to be unbelievably gracious to each other, unbelievably gracious to the process. The, the, the problem is, is when you establish this idea of a grace-filled community, um, you will be, it'll be frustrating and maddening to folks that are prideful and legalistic. To have a community of grace, um, those that want to remain rule-based in everything. And uh, I'm not saying no boundaries. I'm not saying not having structure and all those things. I'm just saying, man, we've got to be so enthralled with the idea of giving one another grace, so appreciative of each other's process each step away, each step of the way. But it is messy. You cannot get around this. If you want to have a clean community and where everyone comes in and they're looking just fine and they're smiling and they're like, oh, I love Jesus and all that stuff. If you want to have a clean looking community, then you don't have, you won't have a gracious one because the reality is, is when you have a more legalistic community, um, the more clean it looks. Uh, when you have a truly gracious community, it is messy. And if you don't believe me, read the Bible. If you don't believe me, go look at and read any of Paul's letters. Look at the community of people Jesus brought together. It is messy and it can be frustrating. Um, it can feel like sometimes we're going this way, but to give grace, maybe that grace looks differently for this person and that grace might look differently in this scenario and that grace looks, and it doesn't just fit the rules. It's, it's hard, but that's what we're supposed to do. That is literally what Jesus did for us. 
Like there's not one of us that hasn't experienced, if we call ourselves followers of Jesus, that has not experienced the overwhelming grace of Jesus that we did not deserve. And he did it specifically for you, specifically for me in the way that we needed it. And our community should be in the same way. Um, I wrote down some things about why it's messy. It's messy because you want someone to be further, right? You're with someone, you're like, oh, can you please just take the next step? And it's messy because sometimes you want them to take a leap, but they're just only willing to crawl at this point in time. But it's messy. It's messy because grace rattles your rule-based religion. It goes, when you keep giving people grace, you're going to be like, oh, I don't like the way that makes me feel. I just, I, they, that, it doesn't goes outside my oh, I, I like this rule that I have in place for my life and what it does for me. And they're going outside of that and, and it goes and it becomes messy. It's messy because it's easier to run or judge than stay committed to a process. It's messy because it requires us to embrace a responsibility to be committed to one another. When Jesus in Matthew 28 talks about um, that our goal is to go ahead and make disciples, we see Christianity concentrates too much on conversion. Conversion is a thing, I mean, someone, someone says yes to Jesus. Of course, that's a thing. Um, but the reality is, is that we're supposed to go make disciples. That is a commitment to one another. And it takes a long time to do that. It actually takes a lifetime to do that. But it's messy when we have to do that because it takes so much responsibility. It's messy because it isn't about being together in heaven, but experiencing life together now. Um, what's kind of been, you might have been raised with this, that everything's about get to heaven, get to heaven, get to heaven, get to heaven. Well, when you want to do it that way and you think about escaping the world, then it's easy not to be gracious to other people because it's about escaping what's here. But Jesus didn't teach that way. He taught about the kingdom of God here on this earth now and to establish that now and experiencing it now. And to do that, you've got to be gracious to one another. Um, it's messy because we can't play the role of the spirit. So we can't nag or force people into something. There are going to be situations where you're just really hoping that someone would get it and they don't get it yet but you just got to stay there and you got to be with them each step of the way. Uh, it's messy because uh, everyone's transformation is different um, and the pace is different. And um, the reality is, is, is grace is unfair in a lot of scenarios. I know it's like we want grace, but it feels so unfair sometimes that someone else gets grace and it's messy. It doesn't mean that we aren't trying to take steps in the right direction. It doesn't mean that we aren't calling people to truth. It doesn't mean that we aren't dressing sin and all of that stuff. But we want a messy, grace-filled community. To desire anything less than a messy, grace-filled community is to desire less than what Jesus set up himself. Here's the third thing. We need a community of humility. Um, there are 1.3 million people in the greater Richmond area. For us to reach 1% of that, that's 13,000 people. So just for a second, just understand that we need all churches. Um, we need all forms of worship to Jesus. Uh, we need all expressions of it. Um, we need the more charismatic. We need the more liturgical. We need the more um, kind of middle of all that stuff. We, we need uh, every single possible engagement and expression of following Jesus. And for us as a church, the reason why I say uh, I want us to be a, a, a humble, humble community is that we're not it, y'all. Like, I love what we do, and I want us to do things with excellence, but we are not the be-all, end-all the church. Do I think if we didn't exist that Richmond would feel it? Yes, I do think that's the case. Um, but man, we've got to appreciate the path God has put us on. We do it with excellence, but we do it with utter humility and we cheer one another on. We, we are the biggest supporters and encouragers of other churches in this area that are doing great work to reach people for Jesus. Um, in Mark 4, uh, starting in verse 26, Jesus is talking, and, and he says this, and, and I love it. He says, this is what the kingdom of God is like. A man scatters seed on the ground, that's us. Night and day, whether he sleeps or gets up, the seed sprouts and grows, though he does not know how. All by itself, the soil, I'm going to highlight it again. All by itself, the soil produces grain. First the stalk, then the head, then the full kernel in the head. Um, as soon as the grain is ripe, he puts the sickle to it because the harvest has come. What Jesus is saying is like, hey, y'all, like, you're going to plant some seeds, and you're not even going to understand how it's growing. And you're going to understand when it's growing. You're not going to understand when the harvest is. But your job is to just humbly serve and, and be 
planters of seed. And so even for us as a church, we try and knock down barriers. We try and um, understand and clear the way for people. We're trying to make sure people's experiences as they come in on a Sunday or in discipleship or in community groups or when we you know, serve with our partners, that all of those things deeply matter and doing those things with excellence deeply matters. I think doing things with excellence like honors people, honors their time, honors their experience and carves out ways for people to experience um, Jesus in a profound way. Um, we aren't going to be willing to if we're not willing to engage that side of it and we get cocky or arrogant or prideful, um, then we're not being responsible with the things that Jesus has given to us. We're not in the roles that he's given us or the gifts that he's given to us. And so we have to humbly step into this and understand, all right, God, you have placed us in the city for such a time as this, and what an honor it is to serve and love people in this and to be a part of someone's process. And so we engage it in that manner. You know, we live in a world where humility is looked down on, but the reality is to actually follow Jesus, it's required of us. And so I just want us to be a church that Again, we're Jesus-centered, we were messy, gracious people, um, but that we approach all this with such humility and we're just always giving honor to God. Um, and humility allows us to grow more. I just jotted this down this week that no matter how much you've grown, you need to grow more. And, um, and sometimes that's reluctantly, sometimes that's uh, 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 you're excited about growth, um, but the reality is, is no matter what season we're in, I don't care how young or how old you are, um, you have more to grow. Here's the last thing, and I'll close with this, um, that we need to be, we need to be a committed, forgot the E there, committed community. A committed community. Um, we have to be committed to wrestling through things together. We have to be committed to people's process together. We have to be committed to loving and serving and honoring one another. We have to be committed to these things. We don't just run when things get hard. We don't just run when maybe there's some conflict. We don't just run when maybe we disagree, um, that we engage things in the right way and that we are committed to each other. Everything that we are kind of Throw, uh, th is thrown at us from the world's perspective is about individualism and selfishness and go get your own. And I mean, shoot, like think about the first 22 years of your life are really centered about you and your individualism, even throughout the education system, right? And so that's like what we're kind of, in, what's ingrained in us. But to actually faithfully follow Jesus, it's about community. It's about being committed to one another. It's um, truly about... Um, you know, we can't fully image, uh, be the image of God unless we do it together. Um, there is a piece of the image of God in me, right? But when you get 10 people around that all have a different kind of perspective and a different kind of understanding and God has gifted them in different ways and what ends up happening is that communally we become this image of God if we do it the right way. But we, in order to do it, we have to be committed to one another. If you're staying at home right now, and you just don't feel comfortable, uh, you know, coming to a live gathering. I completely understand that. And I res completely respect uh, your decision there, too. And, and it makes sense to me. Um, but you still have to be committed to the community. And that doesn't mean just simply watching every week. It's, it's even for you. What about inviting people to watch with you? What about maybe uh, starting an online community, an online small group uh, of people that you gather on Sundays and maybe it's over Zoom and, and you figure out a way to discuss things like afterwards, um, figure out ways to maybe invite people to be like, hey, will you watch this online with me today? And understanding that you still have a chance to be committed to the mission that Jesus has for our community. To be com committed to one another, we don't just run away. We celebrate, we're generous, we serve one another uh, unbelievably well. We want this generational attachment because we're um, committed to the right things. Like we want older people to be having an attachment to younger folks and younger folks having an attachment to older folks because we are committed together. Um, we wanna push our agendas aside because we're so focused on the things that Jesus wants for us. Every single person that walks in on a Sunday or is engaged in a discipleship or in a community group or serving with one of our partners, whatever, every single one of us has a little bit of a personal agenda. And um, 
we've got to be willing to, to again, be humble enough to know those areas where we have a personal agenda and be like, all right, what does Jesus want for me here? Um, I close with this quote um, that I, that's not a quote, it's just what I wrote down. Um, so I'm quoting myself on this. Um, I said, personal agendas within the church focus on preferences instead of the cross and it will attempt to choke out the word of God. When it becomes about our personal agendas, when it becomes about our own preferences, we will eventually try to choke out the word of God. And here's the thing. When Jesus talks about choking out the word of God, he actually talks about this in Mark 4, that when people try to do this, when people try to bring their agendas and allow the word of God to be choked out simply because of preferences, and um, what Jesus calls that is satanic. Again, another hard thing that Jesus actually says in this. And so I get it. Like, this might have felt like a little aggressive in tone today, or it felt like I'm pushing a lot or whatever. Um, and sometimes that comes out of me, and you guys know that um, usually a few times a year I'm going to get in it like this. But I, I, I don't want us to be a community um, that just simply settles or simply uh, stops pushing or is like, you know, this has worked for six and a half years. Let's just keep doing that. I want us to be a commu community that when you think about following Jesus, there's this excitement, there's this passion, there's this incredible need. Because here's the reality. People don't need to see another progressive or conservative view of things. They don't. They can get that anywhere. What we need is a jesus centered view to all of this. They need to experience a Christ-centered community that's loving and gracious and kind and generous. Um, they need to see that this is a compelling thing for them to uh, be involved in, something that will shake the foundation of their life, shake the foundation of how they view things, um, shake every part of their, their mindset towards how they see their purpose in life. The, the truth is, is we are radically, or I should say should be, we are radically different than the world, yet radically committed to seeing it flourish. And we can only do that through Christ. So that's the challenge for us. And we're going to talk about this more. Um, there's going to be part two of this um, next week. Um, so over the next several weeks, though, like we're going to talk about what does it look like for us to go back, to move forward, to have a future um, in, that is designed towards the way that God wants us to go, to be willing to step out of the boat in the midst of this and trust who God is. Let's pray. So God, this morning, I, you know, I realized that um, I went through a lot and threw a lot out there. And um, I also realized some of this has been stirring in my heart for a while, um, waiting to get out and um, could feel like a lot. And so I get that. Um, but no matter what, God, I just pray everyone coming away this morning will have an understanding of who we want to be. And even if it's just simply that we're Jesus-centered, that we're a grace-filled, we appreciate the messiness of grace, that we just want to be humble, and that we just want to be committed to one another. If, if those are the only things that people walk away with, it, I'm cool with that. But God, I just hope that and pray um, that hearing what you've placed on my heart is something that's exciting for folks. It's something that... Um, they want to engage, and they want to fully participate in. They want to experience you in an, a life-giving, life-altering way that um, maybe they haven't ever before. God, I'm not. What I hope for this in this year in 2021 is that um, you will be using our church community in different ways, that you will, your spirit will be moving in a whole new way this year, that we will have new opportunities, um, that we will see new people come to know you, that we will see new folks come to be a part of our community, that we will um, have an, uh, that we will be known for like, hey, they're not a progressive church, they're not a conservative church, that, that they really are, they're just a Jesus-centered church, they're outside of those things. You can't pin them down in one way. And through that, God, I just pray that um, you will do things far beyond we could ever imagine. And in the same way that Peter took a chance and decided to, to walk on water, and he did for just a second, God, my prayer is that um, we'll have that kind of trust in you. 
and what, who you are and, and what you can do and, and that and then have a humility that it's how cool it is that we get to be a part of this. So God, we just thank you in advance for what you're going to do in our community. We thank you now for the way that you're reshaping our hearts and minds and love you. In your name we pray. Amen. Well, guys, thank you so much for um, watching here today. And again, thank you for, uh, you know, we closed out the year in such a great way uh, with your generosity, um, of course, with the share offering, but um, also in just general giving. So many of you guys have committed to be consistent givers and to do that either weekly or monthly or bi-monthly, whatever. Uh, you guys have just been awesome with that. And um, again, that generosity is is designed to make an impact in Richmond and to work with our partners and um, help in, impact and influence thousands of people throughout this city. And um, it's actually starting to move. Now we're getting some things that we're able to do internationally as well um, because you guys are so dang generous, which is awesome. And so thank you so much for that. Um, love you all. Um, have a great rest of your week and we will see you next week. Thanks so much for watching with us this morning. If you're out there and have questions, prayer needs, or want to talk to someone about next steps in your faith, then head on over to this link. We'll see you next week.